This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Churchill. Churchill was released in 2015 by GMT Games and designed by Mark Herman. This game supports from 1 to 3 players and takes from 1 to 5 hours to play. Churchill is a political war game where each player assumes the role of one of the big three allied leaders during World War II. In this game, leaders debate issues to win resources to advance their respective military fronts versus the Axis in the Europe and Pacific theaters. While winning World War II is the primary objective, each leader is also attempting to best position his nation politically for the post-war world. The progress towards these various objectives are awarded victory points, which will ultimately determine the winner of the game. Welcome back to the Harsh Rules Churchill Tutorial. This is the second episode in the series and we're going to jump right in by learning the basic game mechanics of the military display. Once we've thoroughly grounded ourselves in these concepts, picking up the gameplay rules for the conference phase will be much easier. So let's get started. To really simplify things, we're going to just focus on the Pacific Theater map. I've also removed all the game pieces. The training scenario starts players at nearly the end of World War II. As a result, all the game pieces start in the middle of things and players don't understand how they got to their current position, so let's start with a clean board. First of all, let's learn about the various front tracks on this map. If you remember from the first episode, each player has the responsibility of one or more fronts on a particular theater. In the Pacific Theater, the Soviets used the Far East Theater route to Japan. Let's place the Soviet front marker at the beginning of this track. The first space in a front track is called the Theater Box. A quick note to this track. The Soviet front marker cannot proceed farther than Manchuria until certain conditions are met. During the conference phase, there's an issue for Stalin to declare war on Japan. Once this issue is resolved, the Soviet front marker can proceed onwards towards Japan. This front can also proceed if Germany has surrendered, the Americans have developed the A-bomb, and the Soviet front marker has reached Manchuria. Keep this in mind when playing as the Soviets in the Pacific Theater. England has the China-Burma-India front, or the CBI front track. And America has two front tracks to Japan the Central Pacific Theater, and the Southwest Pacific Theater. The military goal for this theater is for each allied nation's front marker to advance across their track spaces. Each space represents a specific battleground on the route to Japan. Once Japan is taken, the war in the Pacific ends. Victory points are awarded for each front marker's proximity to Japan. Front tracks with multiple victory point indicators do not stack points. An allied nation only earns the victory points for the space their front marker occupies at the end of the war. Most spaces are land territories. However, if there is an anchor icon in the corner of the space, then it is considered an amphibious space. An amphibious space requires the theater box to have at least three naval support markers to enter. Some amphibious spaces like Normandy require even more naval support markers. Besides landing in Japan, some spaces on the American front tracks will say B-29. If the Americans have developed the A-bomb and the front marker is on one of these B-29 spaces, then they are within range to use a B-29 bomber to deploy the A-bomb and end the war with Japan. Also unique to this map, if the space says Kamikaze, then a front entering this space will lose one naval support marker. Now that we have a good lay of the land, let's look at the gameplay mechanics for moving a front marker. During the military segment of the war phase, each allied player will make an attempt to advance their front markers to the next space on the front track. Successful advancement is decided by the roll of a 10-sided die. The number required to roll is determined by the Allied Front's strength. An Allied Front's base offensive strength is 2. 
Therefore, to advance the front to the next space requires a die result of two or less. However, an allied player can increase their chances of advancing by exchanging production markers, the game's currency of sorts, for offensive support markers. Each offensive support marker adds two to that allied front marker's strength. Adding additional offensive support markers greatly increases an allied player's chances of advancing their front. And, if the total strength of a front is 10 or greater on land spaces, a breakthrough occurs. A breakthrough gives the allied front an opportunity on land spaces to advance forward two spaces. To score a breakthrough, the player must have a modified strength of 10, essentially four offensive support markers. When eligible for a breakthrough, rolling a 10 will allow you to move the front marker to land spaces. Adding additional offensive support markers beyond the four will add a plus one to the die result per each strength point beyond 10. Essentially, a plus two modifier per additional marker. This can make rolling a breakthrough much easier. A final note, offensive support markers are removed at the end of each round. This means that players will need to allocate production and rebuild their offensive support after each conference. This can make attempting a breakthrough pretty costly. Also remember, when trying to enter an amphibious space, front markers require at least three naval support markers. Naval support markers are always placed in the theater box at the beginning of a front track. Naval support markers do not add to a front's strength. They serve more as transports in the game. A final note, although offensive support markers are removed at the end of the game round, naval support markers remain unless removed by military action, such as a naval unit or kamikaze attack. Now that we've discussed adding naval support and defensive support, let's pause for a moment and look at the game's economy. The currency of this game is represented by production markers. Each nation generates a set amount of production units per game round. British production is set at four units, American production is six units, and Soviet production is set at three units. These production units can be traded one for one for a number of items. Production units can be traded for military items in the form of offensive support to increase a front's chances of advancing or naval markers to allow a front to cross a water space. They can also be spent to increase the chances of advancing A-bomb research. Or production can be used to activate a one Paul Mill issue that will allow the player to place clandestine networks and political alignment markers on colonies and country spaces. There are also opportunities to earn additional markers such as the strategic materials issue or for the Soviet Union they can increase naval units in the Arctic theater box to three or employ the Murmansk convoy via the appropriate conference card. Now, the fun of playing Churchill is that you can debate to tell other nations how to spend some of their production. In this way, richer nations like the U.S. can be convinced to spend their resources on Soviet interests. We'll see how all that works a little later in the tutorial during the conference phase. Obviously, the Japanese military is not going to let the Allies just waltz right up to Japan. The Japanese will deploy their own forces to prevent the Allied player from advancing. Each Japanese army unit, represented by a tan cube, placed in the next space will remove one offensive support marker from the Allied front. This will decrease the Allied front's chances of advancing. And, if the Japanese army units meet or exceed that front strength, then the Allies will not be able to roll to advance that front at all. The Japanese will also deploy their naval units, represented by gray cubes, to stop the Allies. Japanese Imperial Navy units automatically remove one naval support marker from the front's theater box. The Pacific Theater requires a great deal of naval support to cross the many amphibious spaces to reach Japan. Therefore, losing just one naval support marker 
can reduce the naval support level below the requirement of three and stop the front from advancing. The good news for the Allies is each Axis power has limited military resources to deploy in each theater. The Japanese have four army units and two naval units to deploy. Let's head back to the Pacific Theater map display and discuss how that works. A common practice when playing Churchill is to place the Axis Army and Navy cubes on the home country space at the center of each map. Let's consider the Japan space our holding box for our Japanese military reserve pool. Total Japanese forces include four tan army cubes and two gray naval cubes. Every game, the cubes will be deployed from this military reserve pool and assigned to specific fronts based on a priority order of the allied positions on the map. The priority event list with the cube placement instructions are listed on the map itself. Basically, the overall assignment for placing reserve pieces in the Pacific Theater use the following priority scheme. Priority number one is Japan itself. Priority two is the Far East Theater Front controlled by the Soviets. Priority three is the Central Pacific Theater Front controlled by the Americans. Priority four is the Southwest Pacific Theater Front also controlled by the Americans. And priority five is the China-Burma-India Theater controlled by the British. Knowing this basic priority sequence will make checking the list less redundant. Now let's quickly walk through the list and see how the assignment process works. Assignment number one, if a front can move into Japan, then all remaining army reserve units are assigned to the Japan space. Priority number one. Assignment number two, if the Soviets declare war on Japan, then assign two Japanese army reserve units to oppose the advancement in the Far East Theater. Priority number two. Assignment number three, if a front is about to enter a B-29 space, place one army reserve unit in that space. If multiple fronts are entering B-29 spaces, prioritize the army reserve unit as follows. Priority number three, the Central Pacific Theater. Priority four, the Southwest Pacific Theater. And priority five, the China-Burma-India Theater. Assignment four and five are linked and regard naval units. To start off this assignment, a player will roll a six-sided die. On a result of one to two, place that naval unit on a front marker attempting to enter an amphibious space. If multiple amphibious spaces, use the priority three, four, and five schemes. If the die result is three through six, take no action. Assignment five is a continuation of assignment four. If a naval marker is placed, then after eliminating an Allied Naval Support Marker in the front box, the battle for the Philippine Sea and Leyte Gulf occurs. Roll the six-sided die again. On a roll of one to four, the Naval Unit is permanently eliminated. If the result is five or six, the Naval Cube is returned to Japan's Military Reserve Pool. A quick note, this is one of the few ways to reduce the cubes to be deployed from the Military Pool each round. Details for permanently eliminating cubes is listed in the Japanese military collapse box printed on the board. Assignment number six, any remaining army reserve units left in the military pool are assigned by rolling a six-sided die for each unit. Please note this is only for army reserve units. The process only allows one naval unit to be placed per round. The assignment die results for each front track are also printed on the map. Basically, this follows the three, four, five priority scheme we've already established. A roll of one to two assigns the army to the Central Pacific Theater, priority three. A roll of three to four, the Southwest Pacific Theater, priority four. A roll of five or six, the China-Burma-India Theater, priority five. Now this covers off on the military uses for the maps, but before we look at the post-war political landscape for placing clandestine networks and political alignment markers, let's talk about one last space, and that is the Pacific Theater Command Space. There is also a European Theater Command Space that follows the same rules. These Theater Command Spaces can be controlled by the Americans or the British. This simulates the historical debates 
for leading the various theaters in the war. Ownership of these spaces can be debated as an issue during the conference phase. What's important to know is what at stake, for whoever controls these spaces gains an additional naval support marker and an offensive support marker per round. So keep this in mind as you build up strategies for these maps. Now, let's talk about the underground political aspect of this map and look at the mechanics behind clandestine networks and political alignment markers. Besides winning the war, another goal of the Big Three is to spread their political influence and shape the post-war world to benefit their nation. To accomplish this, players will seed Axis-controlled colonies and countries with markers representing clandestine networks and political alignment. Success in establishing post-war affiliation with colonies and countries rewards these players with victory points. Colony and country spaces on the game board are identified as darker shaded squares that branch off from a front track. In the Pacific Theater, these spaces are considered colonies. In the European Theater, these spaces are considered countries. For example, in the Pacific Theater, in the China-Burma-India front track, the Kra Isthmus and French Indochina spaces have several colony spaces branching off in darker shades of blue. Each of these darker spaces represent the colonies of Siam, Dutch East Indies, Malaya, Vietnam, and Cambodia Laos. From a game mechanics perspective, there is little difference between colonies and countries. However, the loss of colonies represents the decline in the British Empire and will have an effect on relations with Churchill and the British player. We'll talk about that more in the conference phase. For now, let's just focus on the colony spaces in the Pacific Theater. A nation first spreads their influence by placing clandestine networks. Clandestine networks represent support to partisans and extensive intelligence operations opposed to the Axis powers. Each player automatically receives one clandestine network marker. Additional clandestine network markers can be earned through conferences, leaders, staff cards, and allocating production to the Paul Mill issues. I'll show you how all that works in the conference section of this tutorial. A clandestine network can be placed in a country with no existing networks or used on a one-to-one -one basis to cancel out a fellow player's network. A country or colony can have a maximum of two clandestine networks of a single color. Just remember, these markers cannot be moved once they've been placed. For example, the United Kingdom could place a clandestine network in Siam. Then, the Soviet Union decides to use one of its clandestine networks to cancel out the British network in Siam. From this point, if the Soviets had a second clandestine network, they could place their own in Siam, or leave the country open to receive a clandestine network from any other country. Placing clandestine networks is important because each one is worth one victory point. Inserting a stronger political presence into a colony or country is represented by a political alignment marker. Political alignment represents formalized influence within that country or colony's government or upper class. Political alignment markers can be earned at conferences by leaders and staff cards, as well as allocating production to Paul Mill issues. We'll cover off more about this process a little bit later. Similar to clandestine networks, other nations can use their own political alignment markers to remove their opponents on a one-to-one -one basis. However, removing a political alignment marker does not affect the clandestine networks. Therefore, a different color of clandestine networks and political alignment can occupy the same colony or country space. The key advantage to placing political alignment markers is that they supersede all clandestine markers for victory points. For example, placing a red clandestine network would earn the Soviets one victory point. However, once the Soviets place a political marker, it supersedes the clandestine network's value and the Soviets then earn three victory points. Players are not allowed to add the victory points of the clandestine network and the political alignment marker together. 
In a similar fashion, if the clandestine network is of a different color, that nation does not receive victory points once a political alignment marker of a different color is present. Those victory points would all go to the owner of the political alignment marker. A final gameplay mechanic for this internal competition for post-war affiliation is the proximity of the front line. Remember, most of the insertion of clandestine networks is done when the country or colonies are under Axis control. However, when the front marker passes a space with branching colonies and countries, they are considered to be behind the front line. When the control of the region changes, this can have a purging effect for opposing nations' markers. Put simply, a British or American front will remove one Soviet clandestine network from each colony or country when it passes, and a Soviet front will remove one clandestine network of the US or UK from each country or colony. This is also a benefit of placing a political alignment marker because they're not affected by an advancing front. Keep these rules in mind as you set up your own nation's post-war strategy to gain victory points. We're just about done with the military display on the game board. We'll return later when we lay out all the game phases in their proper order during the conference section tutorial. But for now, let's take a brief look at the European theater map. The European theater has two fronts that lead all the way to Germany. The Western theater is the responsibility of the Americans. Similar to the Far East theater on the Pacific map, the Western theater cannot be fully opened until the second front issue is won during the conference phase. Also, the theater box will require five naval support markers for the front marker to enter Normandy. Next up is the Eastern Theater, controlled by the Soviets. This is the most straightforward theater in the game. It's all land spaces all the way to Germany. After that is the Mediterranean Theater, which is a partial front controlled by the British, meant primarily to defeat Italy. This front does not connect to Germany at all. Finally, there is the Arctic Theater. This theater does not have a front track. However, if three naval support markers are added to this theater's front box, then the Soviets gain one additional production marker. Norway and Finland can also be controlled from a clandestine network and political alignment perspective. Now, let's look at the opposition. Germany's military reserve pool is comprised of six German army reserve units, represented by black cubes, one Italian army brown cube, and one gray navy cube. Similar to the Pacific Theater, there is a cube assignment box and a military collapse box for actions that can permanently remove cubes from the German military reserve pool. The assignment priority for cubes is as follows. Priority 1, Germany itself. Priority 2, the Western Theater. Priority 3, the Eastern Theater. Priority 4, the Mediterranean Theater and Priority 5, the Arctic Theater. Now let's quickly walk through the reserve assignments. Assignment 1. If a front is poised to enter the Germany space, place two German army units there. Assignment 2. Place one army in the Eastern Front. Assignment 3. If the Western Theater front marker has not left its theater box, deploy one naval unit there to eliminate a naval support marker. Assignment 4. If the Western Theater front marker has not left the Bolero space, deploy four German Army Reserve units in the Eastern Theater. Assignment 5. If the Western Theater front marker is in the Bolero space or beyond, deploy one German Army Reserve to oppose them. Assignment 6. If Normandy has been entered, place two German Army Reserves in the front closer to the German space between the Western Theater and the Eastern Theater. Assignment 7. Place the Italian Army Reserve Unit in the Mediterranean Theater. And finally, Assignment 8. The remaining Army Units are randomly distributed amongst the fronts by rolling a six-sided die for each unit. If the die result is 1 or 2, place the unit in the Western Theater. A 3 or 4, Eastern Theater. A result of 5, the Mediterranean Theater and 6, the Arctic Theater, if any naval units can be deployed. Otherwise, deploy the unit to the Mediterranean Theater. 
Remember to reference the military collapse box as well for opportunities to reduce the cubes in Germany and Italy's military reserve pool. Some final points of interest to highlight on this map. The A-bomb research track discussed in the first episode which relates more to the Pacific Theater but overlaps onto this map. The European Theater Command Space which functions in a similar capacity as its Pacific Theater counterpart. You'll also notice that this map has far more opportunities for placing clandestine network and political alignment markers. So most of that gameplay function will occur here. And now that we've finished here, let's head back to the full display. Now that we're back to the full view with the board set up, the game piece position should make more sense and some of you might already be formulating strategies how to advance your preferred nation's fronts to victory as well as how to take best political advantage of the colonies and countries on the various maps. This is great because now that we have a better understanding of the function of this side of the board, our next step is to learn the political world of the Big Three on the other side of the board. In the next episode, we will cover the rules for the conference phase. With all the knowledge we've gained from the war phase, what I consider the job that needs to be done, we now have the context necessary for the political discussion of how to deploy the resources and strategic directives, in my analogy, the tools needed to do the job. When we walk through the conference phase in the next episode, all of these mechanics and concepts should begin to click. Questions about this game, requests for future Harsh Rules game tutorials, and constructive feedback are all greatly appreciated. Drop a line in the comments section. To be the first notified when this episode and any Harsh Rules episode is placed online, please subscribe to this channel. Until then, I'm Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.